So we are starting a new topic today, and sadly, there's not very much math. Uh, so lots of concepts, and tomorrow we'll start drawing shapes. So if you're an artiste, this is your, your deal if you like making dots and writing symbols. Uh, today we're not going to do that, sadly. All right, so there's all the vocab and all that good stuff. And the homework for tonight is worksheet number one, which is located right underneath the electronegative values. So we'll talk about that here in a minute. Um, so bonding. This whole topic and next topic will deal with bonding. For this topic, we're going to talk about the bonding between atoms. And then next topic, we'll talk about the bonding between molecules. Now, we I haven't talked about it in here. But which one do you think is stronger, the bonds between atoms or the bonds between molecules? Molecules. Atoms, very good. <laughs> so when we talk about looking at, say, like a water molecule, water, if I boil water, say, a whole bunch of water molecules, the bond between the molecules breaks, not the bond between the hydrogen and the oxygen. And think about that. If when water boiled, the hydrogen and the oxygen left each other, your kitchen would explode every time you boiled water. So that that would be bad. So yeah, the bonds between the atoms are much, much stronger. Because you're creating hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, both very flammable in the presence of flame or heat. So that right there should tell you that the bond between the atoms are much stronger. All right, chemical bonds. These are the attractive forces between atoms or ions within a compound. And we'll talk about those a little bit more. Uh, factors that affect the bonding, the electrical nature of the bond. So in some cases, we're going to be looking at ionic bonds that have positive and negative charges. In other cases, it'll just be the, the sheer attraction between the atoms. So some atoms like other atoms more than others, just like you like certain people more than others. So some atoms are attracted to certain types of atoms more so than others. And in some cases, they don't want anything to do with them which is quite all right. Um, the term isoelectronic, we've already talked about isoelectronic. What does that mean? Before Christmas, we talked about it. Might have been even before Thanksgiving. <laughs> I can't remember yesterday. Isoelectronic means the same electron configuration as the noble gases. So if we're looking at nonmetals, are they trying to gain electrons to fill up their octet? They are going to fill them up. And then the metals are going to lose those electrons. So metals will have a positive charge where nonmetals will have a negative charge if they're forming ions. And again, it's all about what happens in the S and P orbitals. Molecular arrangement, we will talk about molecular arrangement, not today, maybe starting tomorrow, but definitely by the end of the week, we'll talk about molecular arrangement. We'll talk about tetrahedral shapes, trigonal bipyramidals, trigonal planers, oh, it's going to be awesome, you'll love it. So we'll wait and talk about that later. However, the shape of the molecule is really important because depending on the shape of the molecule determines whether or not this thing will do anything. So when you look at, say, um, the molecule of cocaine and the molecule of, say, aspirin, there's only one functional group that's different. They have a very similar arrangement. That's why we use aspirin for a painkiller. Cocaine's also very good, but it's not legal, so don't use it. Okay? And a little more addictive than aspirin. Very good. So when we talk about the shape of a molecule, and that's what chemistry is all about, and some of you are going to go into pharmacy, you need to know the importance of why it's shaped the way that it is, because how it binds with other things, how it actually gets into um, those binding sites, like biological proteins block certain things, allow certain things to pass through. So we'll talk about that later. Um, bond energy. You will hear me talk about bond energy a little bit in here. We talk more about it in AP, but just know that bond energy is the amount of energy needed to either make or break a bond. Okay? That's all I want you to know for this class. We won't do any calculations with bond energy in here, I think. Maybe we will. I can't remember. Hmm. Maybe that was AP. I, I can't remember. They all blend together. 
When we talk about ionic bonding, ionic bonding is the bonds between two ions. And when we talk about the bond, we're looking at a positively charged bond, I'm sorry, positively charged ion and a negatively charged ion. Now, we talked about cations and anions in the past. Cations are what, positive or negative? Positive. Remember, cats are very positive. They're very positive creatures. They do exactly what you want them to do. Anions are the negatively charged things. Okay, uh, And they have this electrostatic attraction, kind of like the charges, the differences in the charges. So they're attracted to each other in that regard. Some properties of ionic compounds. They like to conduct electricity. So, for example, if I took a bathtub and I put pure water in it, distilled water in there, and you got in there and say you plugged in your toaster right next to it, held up the toaster and dropped it in, what's going to happen? <laughs> Absolutely nothing, because pure water is a poor conductor of electricity. It doesn't have any ions in it. However, if you fill that up with tap water, put it in there, now you got a show. All right. So the thing is, with the tap water, you've got chlorine, fluorine, other things in there that we don't want to talk about. Back in the day, they used to curl their hair and take a shower at the same time. Yeah. Well, sorry, baths. They didn't have showers. Back then. <laughs> Get an extension cord if you want to try it. Don't. <laughs> All right. Um, and we'll do some things with ionic compounds a little bit later on today. Uh, more so tomorrow with the ions in the, the Lewis dot structure. Have you guys done Lewis dot structure? Yes. Good. It'll be easy. We're not doing it today. Uh, covalent bonding. When you hear the word covalent, I want you to think of one word. Sharing. Okay. So covalent deals with the sharing of electrons. Whereas ionic, there is no sharing. It's a total donation. It's like, if I'm a metal, I'm giving my electrons away. I don't want them anymore. The non-metals are freely taking them. But with covalent bonding, we have sharing. Because most of the time, they're looking at the non-metals with non-metals. And they need to work together to get eight electrons. So they'll do that. And if you look at this awesome little graphic down here, actually here, if I look at, say, the hydrogen, each hydrogen atom, group 1A, each hydrogen brings one electron. What's the maximum number of electrons in that 1s orbital that you can put in there? Two. So what happens is they want to fill up that s orbital. So if we bring two hydrogens over, we just filled it up by sharing electrons. So hydrogen's not stealing a, an electron from another hydrogen. They're sharing. And that's what the circles represent when we start drawing the loose structures. If you see a circle, that means sharing. If you look at, say, chlorine, okay, chlorine, Group 7A each has seven valence electrons. But to get eight, they need to share one of those electrons with each other. So they come over and they say, hey, I got one, you got one. Let's share. Boom, done. Okay, so that's what covalent sharing is. And there's what's called equal sharing and unequal sharing. If I look at these two hydrogens and these two chlorines, okay, do you think that the two hydrogens are sharing these electrons equally or unequally? Equally. Because if it's the same element, kind of like twins, I guess, I don't have any twins, um, they're going to share those equally. However, if they're different elements, that is not going to be equal sharing. So it's kind of like in this case here where the chlorine, and we'll talk about electronegative values here in a moment, the chlorine has a greater attraction or a greater affinity for that shared electron that hydrogen has. And what's going to happen is, if I say that this water bottle is an electron, Luke, come up here for a second. I'm going to put you in the video. Come on up here, Bo. Okay? Say I'm hydrogen and Luke is chlorine. Grab onto that electron. Wave to the camera. Okay? So what happens is, pull that close to you. No, stay in the picture. So pull it close. So what's happening is, we're sharing this electron, but the length in which that electron is away from me isn't as attractive. In other words, this electron that I brought over is that we're sharing this electron, but it's closer to Luke. Thank you, Luke. And this electron has what charge? What's the charge on an electron? Negative. So as that charge gets closer to the other element, it is feeling that negative charge more so than I am. So when my arm was extended, I still was sharing this electron, but it was farther away from me. So I had what was called a partial positive charge, because 
even though this is my electron and we're sharing it, we're not sharing it equally, and that electron that I was sharing was closer to Luke than me. So he's stealing that electron as it gets more so as it gets closer to him. So when we talk about unequal sharing, there's what's called this partial charge. And there's a funny looking symbol down here. These symbols here actually represent the partial positive and partial negative charge associated with the proximity of the electrons to the other atom. Now, you don't have to memorize who has the greater electronegative values because I'm going to give you a table. And that table is right here. So when we look at this table, let me blow it up a little bit. Okay. If I look at this table, you'll notice that fluorine has a value of 4.0, and you have the same table. Where if I look at francium, it has a low value of 0.7. What are metals trying to do with their electrons? Give them away or lose them. Where the nonmetals are trying to get them. So when we look at the nonmetals, they're going to have higher values than the metals will. Because nonmetals want electrons, metals are trying to give them away. So the trend is, as we go left to right, and you don't have to know this, but as we go left to right, the electronegative values go up. As we go down, they go down as well. Because, again, you're getting bigger and bigger, and so they don't want those electrons as much. So fluorine is the greatest, where francium is the lowest. Why do we not have any group 8As or noble gases here? They're full. Yeah, they don't care to have or form compounds. However... When we get down to, say, like the krypton and the uh, xenon and radon down here, they technically have values, but they're more like the metals. So in some cases, as they get bigger, we can sneak some atoms onto them. And I'll, I'll do that every once in a while. All right. Uh, so unequal sharing. And the reason why I put this graphic in here is because we're going to talk about the bonds between molecules next topic. I just want you to know that between, if we're looking at a water molecule, there is a bond between the two water molecules. That's why when it's a liquid or a solid, it's held together. However, you'll notice the partial charges on here. Oxygen has an electronegative value of 3.0, I think, and hydrogen's 2.1. So the higher the electronegative value, the more negative that partial charge will be. Uh, don't Get your panties in a bunch over that graphic. Okay. Please. All right. It's just not worth it. However, this next graphic is actually giving you a summary of how the atoms, quote unquote, look in the sharing of the electrons. When we're looking at a non polar covalent bond, if you want to write below this, this is equal sharing. So underneath the non polar covalent bond, there's equal sharing of electrons. That's why there's that uniformity of the bond or this shape or whatever. The, the black dots represent the nuclei, not to scale, obviously. If you look at the polar covalent, there is sharing, but it's unequal sharing. And who do you think has the greater attraction for the shared electron, the atom on the left or the atom on the right? The one on the right that has the partial negative charge, because again, that electron is closer to that atom than the other. And yeah, the little shape here signifies that they're still sharing, but not equally. And then if you look at ionic bonding, the metal has given away its electron, the non-metal has taken that electron, and we talked about the trends that if something gives away electrons, what should happen to the radius? Does it get bigger or smaller? It gets smaller, okay? And then if you have more electrons than you do protons, then you should get larger. And that's what's happening there. Uh, so below here is just a summary. The non polar covalent bond means that we have equal sharing. Non -polar, or polar covalent bond means that we have unequal sharing, ionic bond, no sharing. It's a total donation. And we already talked about electronegativity, but it, the definition here, it's the measure of the attraction or the affinity. You'll hear me use the word affinity a lot. Fluorine has the highest affinity of all the atoms for other atoms' electrons, and it doesn't care where it gets electrons from. It just wants them. Uh, And there's your table. Oh, I had some notes on there. Sorry about that. Um, predicting the types of bonds. I already have the values written on there. You may want to write these down as well. If we're looking at two atoms, 
Okay, and this will be the way the homework's gonna look tonight, and I'll do one or two of those for you tonight, or before we leave. If the difference in the electronegativity, say we had, um, I think we have an example. Yeah, we'll do that here in a moment. If the difference in the electronegativities is zero, then we have a non-polar covalent bond. In other words, they're sharing those electrons equally. If the difference is between 0.1 and 1.6, generally speaking, we say that is polar covalent. The only time that we're going to say that's polar covalent is if you have two non-metals. Okay? If you have a metal, okay, that's why I have that little triangle up here on the non-metal triangle. We have to have two non-metals. If you ever have a metal with a non-metal, that's ionic. I don't care what your difference in electronegativities is. If you have a metal with a non-metal, that's ionic. If you have two, and I can't think of any situations where it might be like greater than 1.6, but in some cases it might be like hydrogen and fluorine. Hydrogen swings each way, either way. So we'll let the differences in electronegativities determine that. But if the difference in the two values is between 0.1 and 1.6, we're going to say that's a polar covalent bond, as long as there's no metal in there. And if it's a difference of 1.7 or greater, that's ionic. And there should be a metal in there because, again, the non-metal, the metals, those two are on opposite sides of the spectrum there. And, again, these are generalities when I talk about that. And there's a nice little graphic showing that. Let's do some examples. Does everybody have the blanks up to this point? Did I miss something or go too fast? The chart, this chart, differences. Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, Elizabeth. Okay. So let's see. Closer. Oh, just good word. <laughs> All right. So let's. Any others? All right. So let's take a look at the examples or practice problems and this is what I want you to do on the homework tonight it'll be I'll have boxes on the homework but this is the uh, what I'm going for and let me pull up the table to kind of have that near the window That'll make it a little easier for us all right so looking at the first one we're not doing Lewis structures today, so all I want you to do is draw one of each. And in some cases, if I'm, again, we're going to a, a fantasy world here. Say I had HBr3, all I want is between one of each type of atom, okay? So, get rid of that. Don't go too crazy here. So, the line between, and then I want you to write the electronegative value. So, I know hydrogen's 2.1. Bromine, is that 3.0? I'm trying to remember. Bromine, 2.8. Sorry about that. Okay, so 2.8. And if you get a negative, just drop the negative. So the difference between that is what? 0.7. Okay. So where does that fall? Does that fall between 0.1 and 1.6? Yeah. So this is a polar covalent bond, and you can abbreviate it as PC. And since we have our differences in electronegativities as 0.7, the next thing I want to do is identify who has the shared electron between the hydrogen and bromine. Who is who's that shared electron closer to, the hydrogen or the bromine? The bromine. Very good. So the greater the value, the closer that electron is because it has a higher attraction or higher affinity. So you'll represent it kind of like you're making an 8, but stop before you finish it off. That's a lowercase delta, which represents partial negative, or partial positive charge. Because in this case, again, like when Luke and I were up here, that electron was closer to Luke than it was me. I was the hydrogen, Luke was the bromine. So since that electron, which has a negative charge, is closer to the bromine than the hydrogen, they're sharing, but that negative influence is more on the bromine than it is the hydrogen. From the table, yep, and that'll always be given to you if you ask for it. All right, and that, that's all we're doing today. And then, whoop, whoop, come back. So let's look at the next one. So we have 
Say that again, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. So the next one is sodium and fluorine. And fluorine has a value of 4.0. Sodium is what? 0.9? Thank you. 0.9. And if you take the difference of that, 3.1. Yeah. So again, if you get a negative, which you will most of the time because we have our non-metal on the right, just drop it. And what type of bond do we have between the sodium and the fluorine? Ionic. ionic. Very good. Now, whenever it's ionic, and this is important, we have to remember the charges that we use to balance these things. So sodium is in group what? Group 1A. And what are the charges on group 1A atoms? Plus 1. And fluorine is in group 7. Group 7. So all of those will have what charge? Negative 1. Good. So we'll say sodium is a plus 1, fluorine is a negative 1. Let's say we had magnesium as our metal. What would the charge be there? Okay, so let's look on the periodic table. So magnesium is in group 2. So it would have a plus 2 charge. So whenever you have an ionic situation, whatever its charge is, represent it as such. Okay, don't worry about saying, <laughs> well, it doesn't equal 0. That's, that's later. We'll do that later. Okay, that's tomorrow, actually. All right. Balancing. Again, the good old days. And then let's look at N2. So I've got a nitrogen and a nitrogen. And nitrogen has a value of... 2.5 or 3.0? 2.5? What is it? Is it 3.0? Nitrogen 3.0? Kill it. 3.0, okay. Uh, however, this has a difference of zero. zero. So what type of bond do we have? Nonpolar covalent. So that means that they are sharing these electrons equally. What type of partial charges do they have? Or full charges? Or charges? Nothing. If you're sharing equally, there is no greater attraction. Nobody's taking an electron away. So there are no charges. So, I mean, I'm writing this, but you don't have to. There are no charges. No partial or no full? Okay. Sure. Correct. Yeah, so, good call. The only time that we ever do it is with the polar covalent. For the ionics? Yes. For ionic, whatever the charge is on the periodic table, for this, whoever has the higher value gets the more negative. Actually, in both cases, the higher electronegative value is going to be more negative. Okay. That's an easy rule to remember. The higher the value, the more negative it is. Whether it's partial or full, that depends on whether it's poor covalent or ion. Okay. All right, let's look at a homework problem. Just make sure we're all on the same page here. Mm -hmm. So the homework is this. And let me make it so I can draw on it. Let's look at something ugly, like the arsenate, the AS04, and then there's a, that three should be here, not there, not that. Okay. Here's what I want you to do. The instructions say, let's read the instructions real quick. Says determine whether the molecule or compound is ionic, polar covalent, non-polar covalent. If polar covalent, be sure to assign the correct partial charge. And what I didn't put on there, if it's ionic, assign it correct charge, so to speak. So going back, so here's what I want. I want you to write one of each, so AS and then O, and then write the differences in the electronegativities in the next box. So go to your electronegative, electronegative table. 
So, where's arsenic at? Do I have it covered? So arsenic's 2.0, and what was the other one? Oxygen, 3.5. So 2.0 and 3.5. Yeah. So 2.0 and 3.5, and that's a difference of what? 1.5. So what type of bond do we have? Or covalent. Good. And then... Go ahead and, since this is polar covalent, go ahead and tell me what the partial charges are, since it's polar covalent. So arsenic has a partial positive, where oxygen has a partial negative. That's it. So when you look at these, don't freak out and say, whoa, there's four oxygens. Yeah, tomorrow we'll talk about the significance of those four oxygens. But all we care about today is just looking at those. Okay. Because they're all, all the bonds between the arsenic and oxygen are going to have polar covalent bonds. Okay, so that bond's polar covalent, that bond's polar covalent, that bond's polar covalent, that bond's polar covalent. Yeah. Ignore the three, ignore the four. Yeah. Actually, that three should be up here. Sorry. Correct. So pick one nitrogen, one fluorine. Then we use both, correct. Yeah, so for different atoms, okay, for different atoms, we're going to ignore the subscript. For the same atom, we have to use that subscript. Okay. So hopefully that doesn't take too long. Any other questions? All right, so this worksheet is your homework for today.